Cracking Crypto is partnered with City Index. Trade shares, CFDs, Forex, crypto and more with a trusted provider. G'day and welcome, welcome to Cracking Crypto. I'm Andrew Gagan. Good to have your company. Well, let's uh, take a look at how the complex uh, is working this afternoon as far as the coins are concerned. Bitcoin trading in a fairly choppy range. Um, this after US Fed Governor Brainard was out saying the central bank could reduce the size of its balance sheet at a rapid pace. The coin dipping uh, some 3%, currently sitting just above 45,000 US. Uh, the other mover of significant uh, has been Dogecoin. At one point it was up 17%. It has there come off significantly there, uh, more than 7%. That was off the back of Elon Musk announcing a 9% stake in Twitter. Elsewhere in NFT land, demand seems to be waning. Uh, sales on OpenSea, the largest NFT marketplace, have declined to around two and a half billion last month, uh, having halved since January, and around 635,000 people bought an NFT last month, down around 100,000. In other news, US Treasury Department has imposed sanctions on a prominent Russia-backed darknet market site and a cryptocurrency exchange, prohibiting users from making or receiving any contribution or provision of funds for goods and services. According to blockchain researchers, approximately 86% of illicit Bitcoin received directly by Russian and crypto exchanges in 2019 came from one of the exchanges, Hydra. And speaking at the Financial Review's Cryptocurrency Summit, former ASIC chairman Greg Midcraft and venture capitalist Mark Carnegie saying Australia is risking falling behind other nations, putting in place initiatives to win the war for talent in the space and potentially missing out on multi-trillion dollar investment opportunities. This comes as the UK announced plans to mint its own NFTs in an effort to become a world leader in the crypto space. Well, crypto investors are closely watching the rollout of Ethereum 2.0. The rollout is attempting to speed up Ethereum, reduce fees, and fix many of the issues with smart contract platform. So what is the roadmap for Ethereum? And if it should fail, what are the alternative for investors? Well, Director of Research at Token Metrics, Mehdi Farouk, joined Elliot Hasty to discuss what investors need to be aware of. Uh, I, I believe the merge will be bullish for Ethereum, uh, given how nascent the crypto industry is. Uh, just just the news itself, when, when the merge happens in a few months, it, it will be a bullish catalyst. Now, uh, if, if an investor looks more carefully into the roadmap of Ethereum, uh, what they're trying to achieve is first a move towards proof of stake, uh, which will also... Uh, be a bullish catalyst for a lot of institutional investors who are, who are looking for investments which are based on the theme of ESG. So proof of stake will make Ethereum around 99% more environmental friendly. But apart from that, there are some technical nuances that Ethereum can face. At the moment, Ethereum is very composable. And it's, it's composable because the execution layer of Ethereum is on one shot. When I say one shot, it means uh, within one blockchain. So within the roadmap of Ethereum, uh, you, you'll have multiple shards and you'll have roll-ups. So this is something uh, an investor should be wary of. And, 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 and in the medium to long run, it can also uh, provide some negative headwinds to Ethereum, especially if the composability of Ethereum uh, is affected. And, and there's, there are a few other layer ones, uh, in particular Solana, that is basically uh, will still remain composable and will deliver on the scalability uh, uh, dilemma that Ethereum was facing. So even though the news is bullish, medium to long run, but there, there are still some headwinds and some, some, still some execution risks, especially on the composability front, given the roadmap of Ethereum uh, with shards and rollups. So rollups are when other blockchain basically batch all the transaction together and sends, sends it to Ethereum. And, and the issue with that is uh, you, you, you again have issues with composability. So imagine you have different rollups so one is Matic, one is Stockware, uh, one is Optimistic kind of a rollup. There will be like 10, 20 different rollups. And you can think of these rollups as a separate blockchain. 
So all the activity will be isolated rather than being on one chain. And when the, uh, when the activity is isolated, one of the beauty of Ethereum was composability. When one application could build on another and, and leverage the third application and the fourth application, the whole ecosystem can potentially become fragmented, which can be a nightmare scenario for developers and user experience and uh, user interface of a lot of applications. Because one of the reasons why Ethereum has become so popular is because people can can build upon it, can launch their own protocols. I mean, it's certainly why we've seen a lot of NFTs really take to Ethereum. So I guess what what is the risk then if it does become fragmented and why are they going down that that route if you know there is that risk of sort of destroying its core purpose? Yeah, so Ethereum's uh, core purpose, I would say, can be uh, divided into three buckets. One is composability, uh, second is decentralization, and third is security. And, and now Ethereum at the moment is 15 transactions per second. And we have already seen, because of the gas fees, it has been for a newcomer from Web2, very very difficult to navigate. So for example, if I'm I, if I just want to navigate the NFT and the DeFi scene in Ethereum, I'll pay probably more in gas than actual purchases, especially, especially since I'm uh, experimenting with it. So Ethereum 2.0 will solve the scalability issue uh, and will also deliver on the decentralization part through through some of the unique architecture. Uh, but because so so in blockchain there's always a trade-off. If you, if, you, if you reduce the transaction fees, if you scale up and you maintain the security, one thing that does get affected is, is, is composability. So Ethereum, even though it's going in the right direction, uh, you'll have similar kind of security. Um, I, will, I can argue slightly less security, uh, but cheaper transaction costs and faster transaction, faster throughput. So which will be amazing for some of the new beginners who, uh, who, who, who are transitioning from Web2. But again, the risk is of composability, which is something that we'll see how, how it goes on. And we have already seen this kind of play out. So Matic has its own ecosystem. Uh, uh, Starkware has its own ecosystem developing. So, so I think this can cause fragmentation uh, of, of liquidity where all of these blockchain will just use Ethereum as execution there. So you can think of uh, Ethereum as, uh, as a very secure blockchain, decentralized blockchain, and everybody will want to settle there a transaction there and it will become a settlement layer uh, in, in the very long run. Now, one of the other things you did mention was, of course, um, Ethereum is moving to the proof of stake method. And of course, that is relevant for ESG. And we've also seen the likes of the EU and the US both really looking at the um, environmental impacts of cryptocurrency. But I guess as well, there's the flip side of if more institutional investors get into Ethereum, then we could end up with the same sort of, uh, I guess, issue that some people are now having with Bitcoin, where the Bitcoin whales are sort of dictating the price. What's your view on you know, institutional money coming into the game? And of course, they will come into it um, if there is more ESG uh, compatibility to it. Uh, I think institutional money coming in is uh, good for the overall crypto space. Uh, I think it will also push us towards getting more regular uh, uh, in terms of more regulation. But I think it will be very, uh, eventually will become poor for a lot of retail investors because the whole space won't have as much alpha. So at the moment, if you, um, like with my experience, uh, that it, like about about a year and a half ago, we had a SPAC boom. And during a SPAC boom, if you just went on Twitter and in, and, and basically saw what other investors are doing and you just copy that uh, investing or trading strategy, you, you make money. But then there was a boom in the SPACs and then it busted. Same with Ethereum, right? Like when, once institutional come in, all the alpha we had, I think it will eventually start getting evaporized. So either on the fundamental side or on the quantitative side, uh, I think they'll deploy strategies uh, throughout the stack uh, when I say stack, I mean Ethereum, middleware, which is other, which is infrastructure built on top of Ethereum, and DApps, which are built on top of uh, on top of Ethereum. So all of the stacks, I think, all the alpha will start evaporating because when institution comes in, they do their proper due diligence, and I think will be bad news for retail, but good news for the whole ecosystem because it will start to stabilize and uh, become less volatile and act more in line with. Uh, equity markets, which which we have we, which we have started seeing uh, uh, some signs of it. Now, if we are sorry, if we are thinking about the retail um, 
investor. What are some of the altcoins then that are challenging the dominance of, say, Bitcoin and Ethereum? Yeah, so the, the way I, I kind of see my portfolio allocation, 70% uh, is in infrastructure and within those infrastructure, majority of them is, so, is, is allocated towards layer one. So Ethereum, I would still have high percentage because it allows me that absorption of risk. Uh, but there are definitely three other altcoins which, I, which, which are my personal favorite and which I think can compound for a long period of time. Now, we have seen with internet platform, right? So you can think of layer ones as internet platforms where different applications will be built in. So you can think of these layer ones as next Google, next Microsoft, next Apple, or you can even think of them as decentralized app store where other applications can build on top of it in a decentralized manner. Uh, so few of the names that I am bullish on, which I think will compound for next five to 10 years because they have started to generate network effects. So in, in layer ones, when you have network effect, uh, you have uh, you have like a multi-sided platform where investors invest, stakers uh, stake, you have validators securing the chain, users using the platform, and there is a whole flywheel that, that is very difficult to stop. And those flywheels have a feedback loop in itself. So once that network effect starts, it's very difficult to stop. So one, the first name I have for you is Solana. I think it could be amazing Ethereum hedge as well. The reason I'm bullish on uh, Solana is that if you look at other blockchains, so for example, if even if you look at Avalanche or Harmony uh, and even Matic, what other blockchains have done is they have um, copied Ethereum's uh, ethos, right? So they have uh, they, they are EVM compatible. So any developer can copy paste applications from Ethereum and paste it on their chain. Now, in long run, it has issues. Uh, it has a few issues. Firstly, you do not have native ecosystem development. So when I say native ecosystem development, developers haven't built the code, haven't tested it. Uh, it's not battle hardened, battle tested. And, and, and because of that, the developer community kind of uh, becomes weak. The second issue is fragmentation of user experience and UI, which is also one of the issues I kind of see with, uh, with Ethereum is that Let's say when when Aave, which is which is the application built on Ethereum, if they have the choice to build on let's say Polkadot through Moonbeam or Moon River, uh, or or through or or, or or near network through Aurora, uh, they will take that decision to expand. And when they expand that decision, they fragment the liquidity and the user experience. Uh, so which is another concern. Now with Solana, it's a non-EVM chain, so the ecosystem is native. It's not copycat of uh, Ethereum. So in the long run, you'll see new innovations coming in. Uh, developers are battle hardened. They know their code inside out and they have no choice but to deliver since they do not have the liberty to copy paste codes like Ethereum and then put it in another chain. So that uh, if you look at the ecosystem, the ecosystem has been in last 18 months have been rapidly expanding, rapidly booming. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I like uh, I like Solana. The other issue with Ethereum is composability. So it, uh, Solana, uh, since it's a layer one and it's built on one shard, it will have that beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, property that we got used to uh, with Ethereum, where everything can be built on one chain and one application can leverage another application and communicate with another uh, application. And you can have a beautiful intertwine of DeFi and NFT gaming. So Solana also has that. And finally, uh, Solana also will scale with Moore's law. Uh, so it's based on proof of history uh, consensus mechanism, which is novel. And the way it can scale is through GPU. So when, when the GPUs, which every couple of years get faster and can, can process more transaction, as the GPU processing power increases and becomes cheaper, Solana can double that transaction uh, speed per second. So at the moment, it can process about 100,000 uh, transaction per second compared to 15. But over the period of time, it can uh, expand as as GPU becomes cheaper and can process more transactions. So that's one of the uh, one of the blockchains I am uh, very bullish on. The second name I would give you is Avalanche. So Avalanche um, basically has a Ethereum chain, which is called C chain. But what they have is they have subnets. So subnet is application specific blockchains that you can deploy. So let's say if you want to create a very uh, a blockchain which is specific to gaming. Uh, let's say you have a you have a game where you just want your own set of rules, own set of validator set, uh, so you can build on Avalanche subnet, and and also the aim is uh, with Avalanche different subnets will will also uh, allow financialization of assets. So one of the issues uh, we have at the moment 
is that you, uh, when it comes to financial regulations, uh, let's say when you're trying to tokenize real estate or tokenize financial asset, you need to have KYC customers. You have you need to have KYC validator set. You you can uh, you also need an anti airdrop mechanism, which is not possible in Ethereum. But you can customize all of these features in in Avalanche. So for example, uh, when Ethereum, somebody from North Korea can airdrop you, but but from from financial uh, regulation perspective, that should not be acceptable. So with Avalanche, you can customize all of these features within within the subnet and can create customized blockchain for your purposes, whether it's gaming, NFT, uh, or financialization of, of asset. So I'm very bullish on Avalanche as well. Uh, so just like Solana, it also has a secret sauce when it comes to consensus. Uh, it's a snowball consensus, which is also very unique, very fast, uh, um, uh, fast transaction speed. And also, uh, you're also seeing a lot of games being developed on Avalanche. So all the subnets are leveraging Avalanche technology to deploy the games. We have already seen uh, DeFi Kingdom, Krabadra, all of these types of games just own their own blockchain and accrue value to Avalanche. The final uh, blockchain I'm very bullish on is, 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 near eco uh, is near. So near is basically, you can think of Ethereum 2.0, but executed today. Uh, it already has Aurora through which you can copy paste Ethereum's application. It also has Octopus Network where you can even copy paste application from Polkadot and 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 cheaply deploy on Near. Uh, apart from that, it has one of the best teams in, in my opinion. Uh, their engineering knows how to use tooling from Microsoft and Google, and which is very evident from uh, from uh, from some of the development in the ecosystem. So, for example, if you use their wallet. I can have a human readable wallet. So my wallet address is, let's say, medifaruk.near, whilst in case of Ethereum, you have this uh, Jimbal Mumble uh, address, which is difficult to navigate and, and send around or remember. So near ecosystem is using some of the Web2 tooling from Google and Microsoft to create a very good UI UX. And plus the uh, ecosystem has around $900, $800 million plus a development fund that they will use, in my opinion, uh, to uh, hamper up the ecosystem and when that happens the network effect will kick in and i can kind of see it in top 10 to top 15 uh, mark uh, based market cap uh, crypto so it it definitely has two to three x potential from from current valuations so solana near and avalanche they are the challenges to ethereum would you be buying in as an investor now is there a catalyst for sort of their technology that would really um expedite that process uh, I would say with near uh, you did have catalyst, but not not now. But in a few months back, when when they raised when they uh, did raise 150 million to kind of uh, ramp up their ecosystem, I'm also seeing execution more on the marketing end for near. So for me, those are some of the bullish signs. Now for Solana, I think one of the bullish catalysts could be fees market. So they are working on a fees market. So one of the issues you had with Solana, or some of the people from Ethereum ecosystem reverted that in terms of uh, downtime, Solana. Here and there experiences downtime, and because of that, the activity gets halted. So one of the reasons why we sometimes saw downtime was a fee, lack of fee market. So uh, they had a fixed price of 0.005 uh, gas fees, and because of that, uh, sometimes uh, you have bots that uh, spam the network. So one of the cattle, uh, one of the things they're working on is fee market. So once the fee market is uh, is deployed, you'll see better security and more consistent performance for Solana. And then you'll also see more uh, user migrating and more developer migrating to Solana. And also I think another catalyst could be that once um, uh, Ethereum 2.0 happens in, in, in six to nine months, when the merge happens, when you see the, uh, the roll-ups and shards, and you kind of feel like there is this friction when it comes to composability, people might also migrate towards uh, Solana or, or basically argue that uh, Ethereum is kind of similar to, let's say, Avalanche or Near Protocol. So why is Ethereum that expensive? And you can see alternative uh, alternative L1 such as uh, Avalanche and Near to kind of benefit from all of this development. Benny Farouk from Token Metrics, and that's the show. Thanks for watching. Cracking Crypto is partnered with City Index. Trade shares, CFDs, Forex, crypto and more with a trusted provider.